Uh, a lot of what's uh, on our mind these days is uh, Israel. It's always on our mind, certainly in our shul here in Memphis at Baron Hirsch. And in particular, over the last uh, little more than a week, uh, a lot is on our mind relative to understanding what's going on in Israel and what's going on with um, the new peace treaty with the UAE. We also are curious to know what's going on with the coronavirus. We're reading headlines all the time. And really, there's no one better to inform us than uh, Gil Hoffman, who's the chief political correspondent and analyst for the Jerusalem Post. Now, um, Gil is uh, a world-class uh, journalist. Some of you have had the opportunity of hearing him from uh, before. And uh, I can go on and on lauding how incredibly talented he is and the incredible work that he does for the Jerusalem Post. But uh, closest to my heart is that Gil is actually from Chicago. And uh, when I was growing up in Chicago, uh, I would look up to someone like Gil. Uh, he grew up, we grew up together in my grandfather's shul. And uh, I would look up to Gil and say, wow, this is like a superstar. I can't, he's going to go so far if I can only be a little bit like him. And uh -huh. uh, he was a big role model for me growing up. And uh, he and his family. And um, uh, it gives me personal pleasure to, to welcome him and thank him for making the time today all the way from Israel uh, to address us and to talk with us uh, this morning. Uh, just one uh, a housekeeping note. Uh, if you have questions throughout the presentation, you can chat them to me directly, uh, either in the chat openly or a personal message to me in the chat. And at the end, we'll take some time for questions as well. And so without further ado, uh, my good friend, Gil Hoffman. Thank you so much, Rabbi Lairfield, and thank you to all the people who are participating in this event and to Uri, the organizer, for making this work. It's an honor and pleasure for me to be virtually in Memphis, in one of my favorite cities in the world. I was in Memphis about a year ago. I spoke by Rabbi uh, Klein's synagogue, and uh, I was just amazed by the turnout and how much people care about Israel. Um, I also was amazed by the sandwich I had at the JCC earlier that was really yummy. Um, and uh, I had this experience, I spoke there on, a, on um, a Sunday night after speaking on Shabbat in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And I took a bus, a Greyhound bus from Birmingham to Memphis and uh, through Tupelo. And uh, it was a very different part of America way that, than you normally get to see uh, coming from Israel. And uh, it was definitely an experience. Um, and uh, I've gotten to go all over America. I've, I've gotten to speak, thank God, in all 50 states. I, I spoke in the synagogue in Hawaii that trademarked the word shaloha, and the synagogue in Alaska that trademarked the words frozen chosen. Um, but uh, Memphis will always have a special place in my heart. And, and right now I can't travel anywhere. Uh, so the closest I can do is I can go down the street to uh, Rabbi uh, Finkelstein Synagogue and I, I uh, here in, in uh, Baca and I do daven there sometimes. Uh, but uh, for me, it, it was great honor for me to, to uh, grow up in a, in a synagogue run by a Rabbi Lairfield. That, that's the best thing in the world. Uh, uh, Rabbi Lairfield's grandfather was always uh, very inspiring for me. He, he was the rabbi of our synagogue for more than 50 years. Um, and uh, he not only raised amazing children and grandchildren, but he raised a, a community yeah, that's having an impact all over the world. And uh, my inspiration, my love of Zion, my love of Israel, comes not only from my parents, uh, but from him. And I would not be what I am if it weren't for him. Um, and uh, I'm so impressed by the way his grandson uh, is now following his footsteps, inspiring people. I got to see him inspiring people in Albany. And uh, now over here, it, it, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, but the, this is a very different kind of talk than uh, I gave in the past because uh, give you a couple different reasons. Uh, one is that uh, normally people, when they're at a lecture, they are all antsy about whether they could touch their phone. Uh, if they get an important message, is it rude? Can I, maybe if I'm sitting in the back, not sitting in the front. Now you're all on your phone. Now you, you all can touch your phone. It's no big deal. Um, yeah, probably very few of you are, are wearing shoes. 
uh, that makes it a, a very different talk that I've had in the past. And uh, so I'm still adjusting uh, to uh, this uh, situation. Um, over the last few months, it's been a very different here in Yerushalayim. Uh, I'm saying Kaddish for my mother, unfortunately, who passed away on the second day of Pesach uh, after a, a long fight with cancer. And um, she, uh, I, probably laughing at me from Gan Eden right now, because uh, I've, during this time, barely set foot in a synagogue but I'm davening three times a day outside. Uh, the, the one week that they said we were allowed to go into the, into the synagogue itself, I had to ask a rabbi, a, a Shiloh, a question, can you say Kaddish without a cat? Uh, because here in uh, Jerusalem, uh, the uh, stray cats, uh, they're everywhere. And so they're part of our minion out here. Um, so, the coronavirus uh, has had a very big impact. Uh, and so I'll start with that cat, that elephant in the room, because this, our subject today is uh, peace politics and the pandemic. And, and unfortunately, the pandemic needs to be coming first. Um, we at first were bragging to the world about how we handled it so well, about how we made a smart decision uh, as uh, the first country in the world to ban or travel into our country um, and how that helped us stay out of the situation, how we ended up um, doing so much better than other countries of similar size, always comparing ourselves to countries like Switzerland and Belgium and, and look how great we have it. Well, um, unfortunately, we've had a second wave that has hit us pretty bad. And uh, over the weekend, we passed 100,000 cases in Israel. And we are the 30th country on the planet to pass 100,000 cases. And um, we are among uh, the smallest of those countries who have passed 100,000 cases. Um, and uh, that is not good. It happened in part because we opened up our schools and, and while kids tend to not get the virus, they do pass it on pretty quick. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, there are positives and negatives to being a very young country. Um, the negative is that uh, popu there are populations that uh, live very close knit together with all those kids. Uh, and that leads to things being spread quickly. Um, uh, disproportionately, Arabs and the ultra-Orthodox um, are getting uh, the virus more than other populations in Israel are. Uh, they are not dying from the virus disproportion. And uh, that's really interesting because that leads us to the positive of what's happening here with the coronavirus. While we are among the top 30 countries, unfortunately, in cases, we're not among the top 50 in deaths. We've had 825 deaths. And every death is a tragedy, of course. Uh, but the reason why we have so few deaths compared to other countries, uh, let, let's go back to Belgium. We have fewer case, we, we have more cases than Belgium. We have 100,000 cases, they have 80,000. Well, Belgium has 10,000 deaths and we have 825. Um, we have uh, around the same amount of cases as Switzerland and, and they have now uh, 2,000 deaths. Uh, it's also, it's not as stark a contrast as it used to be, but um, how do we have so few deaths? The answer is that we are that young, vibrant society and younger people who get the virus are less likely to die from it. Um, and uh, so if you've got thousands of, of ultra-Orthodox and Arabs that are getting sick, but then recovering, uh, um, and the people who are dying, like the rest of the world, tend to be people 65 and older. And so being a country that is disproportionately young, um, uh, younger than any other country on earth, uh, that has allowed us to have uh, disproportionately fewer people die from the virus. Um, and in that way, we are still very much a leader in the world. Um, but uh, we have a, a long way to go. Oh, to bring that number, oh, 
bring all these numbers back down. And so that's why they're talking very seriously right now about uh, closing down the country completely uh, for uh, Rosh Hashanah, for Yom Kippur, uh, maybe between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, uh, not have businesses work, not allow people to leave their homes for uh, a two week period. Uh, this, these holidays, we might be praying quicker, uh, but uh, they might end up being very long um, with people very limited in what they could do around here. And that's looking more and more likely decisions are going to be made as early as tonight about how to handle that. Uh, and seeing uh, how we've been handling these holidays, I, I think has been very interesting because um, uh, the holidays have brought our families closer together. Um, and I went from uh, Purim in America, I, I was in uh, Boca Raton uh, on a uh, speaking tour. I spoke at Boca Raton Synagogue, the largest Orthodox synagogue uh, on earth uh, around Purim and uh, totally packed with people on Purim. And uh, couldn't, I can't imagine uh, in retrospect, I thank God there no one got sick. Other synagogues in Florida people did. Um, I spoke to uh, groups of senior citizens, more than a, uh, 200 senior citizens packed together the day before Purim and the day after Purim uh, in, in South Florida. And uh, now looking back, it seems crazy that I did that. Uh, but the, our Purim was so different uh, than Pesach when we were all together with our families and we got to see really the spirit of Israel in Pesach, that people went out on their porches and they sang Manishtana together. Um, so while we were uh, only in our homes with the Pesach having more satyrs around the world than ever, because the satyrs were smaller, more than ever in the history of mankind, so we really got to see the, the spirit of Israel. And we hope that this positive spirit that there is here of togetherness that the coronavirus has brought out, and if there's anything positive you can say that's come out of the coronavirus, it's that spirit. Uh, we hope that the, that spirit of Israel will lead to Israel being uh, one of the first countries in the world to have a, a vaccine or a cure. Uh, and then uh, if anybody wants to boycott that vaccine or cure because it comes from Israel, be my guest. Um, obviously we'll take that vaccine or cure no matter where it comes from, but it would be so special if it does end up coming from here. And there are Israeli companies who are working very hard on getting to that vaccine or cure. Uh, and we pray for their success. Uh, so uh, the uh, pandemic leads us to the politics, which is what I cover day in and day out, have now covered day in and day out for 20 years now for the Jerusalem Post. And you would think that the pandemic would make the politicians realize that they have to be um, more humble, that they have to make different decisions than they would normally make. That they have to be, the, that the politicians have to be less political. It hasn't happened, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, across the political spectrum, it hasn't happened. Uh, the politicians are doing what's right for them. And uh, that is why we are right now sitting on the brink of a possible fourth election in 19 months. That could happen on the 17th of November. I don't personally think it's going to happen. Uh, we have still another 30 hours to prevent it from happening, which is an eternity in Israeli politics. Israelis are like journalists. They don't hate, they, Israeli, Israelis don't like journalists, <laughs> but they are like journalists in that they don't do anything until just before a deadline. And, and so 30 hours, that's an eternity by law in Israel. If a government does not pass a budget within its first 100 days, elections are initiated automatically. Our government was formed on the 17th of May, and so 100 days is uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow is the 100th day. <laughs> um, and so uh, if we do not get a budget or a budget deadline extension bill, by tomorrow night at 11.59 p.m. and 59 seconds, we all turn into a pumpkin and have to go back on the campaign trail and prove Einstein's theory of insanity. 
which is doing the same thing over and over and over and over again and expecting a different result. It all goes back to uh, December 24th of 2018. That was the last time we had a fully functioning government. Um, in order to put that date into perspective, the most popular movie in America that day was called Aquaman. If anybody remembers Aquaman, uh, the world has changed a lot since then, unfortunately, mostly not for the better. A and on that day, uh, the Speaker of the Knesset said, we're going to have the Knesset end early that day in honor of Christmas, in honor of the Christian members of Knesset, which was a very nice gesture by him, but he forgot that all the Christian members of Knesset are Orthodox Christians, and therefore they celebrate Christmas on the 7th of January. So the only person who was going to be benefiting from this decision was going to be me, because I celebrate my American Jewish heritage by going to a movie and eating Chinese food that night. Um, but that was the day that Netanyahu ended up moving up our election. It was supposed to be in November of 2019. He moved it to April of 2019. And uh, since then, we've been in election mode, except for the last 100 days, sort of. And uh, we don't want, we the people, don't want to go back to those days. Um, and the question is, will we? And the answer is, it depends on Netanyahu. Uh, Blue and white desperately does not want to go to an election because they would be destroyed. Right now, the polls show them getting nine seats, becoming the fifth largest party in the Knesset, down from uh, the uh, 33, 32 that they won last time, uh, which they're now left with uh, 17 of, depending on how you count. Um, and uh, the, right now, the polls see nine. They'd end up with nothing. Uh, in the end, uh, their voters are voters who don't want to see Netanyahu remain prime minister, and there will be other alternatives instead. Uh, the anti-Netanyahu camp tends to reunite behind the leader, and this time it won't be them. So they desperately do not want to go to an election for their own political reasons and because I think they do care a thing or two about the actual good of the country. Now Netanyahu also does care a thing or two about the good of the country, but he also has a lot of other considerations. Um, he does have a, a trial that's going to be intensifying in uh, January, and uh, he could very well want to get another vote of confidence another four years after that. Maybe the Knesset would be elected, would allow him to pass some kind of bill that would make him immune from prosecution. That is still possible. Um, maybe he's concerned about the election in the United States. He, uh, there's no doubt where he would cast his ballot if he would be allowed to vote. He would vote for his friend Donald Trump. Uh, and um, maybe he's concerned uh, that uh, he needs to get a mandate around the same time there uh, before, uh, if, if it's possible, that Donald Trump wouldn't win the election. Um, so uh, these are all things that the prime minister has to be taking into account, as well as the good of the country. He also has to take into account his own polls, which he thought would be better right now. Um, he thought the deal with the UAE, and I'll get to that more in depth very soon, that the, that the deal with the United Arab Emirates would give him a huge boost in the polls, and, and it, it didn't. Uh, it didn't, even though the people of Israel overwhelmingly support the deal. They just don't vote on such things. Uh, they vote on issues like uh, the economy, um, and the economy right now is not so good. Uh, we unfortunately have uh, a huge amount of unemployment right now, and um, it's not as good as it was uh, in the time of our first election, we, we had 4% unemployment, and, and now we have 20% unemployment. That's a very, very big difference. Uh, I don't recommend any politician uh, going to an election when you have a, a peak in, in unemployment. Uh, people always think the grass is greener with somebody else. Uh, it's very hard for a, an incumbent when the economy becomes the major issue of an election. The ultimate example was I was in Ireland during an election, and uh, it was about the economy there. And people there said that maybe the grass is greener somewhere else. It's not. It's greenest in Ireland. I saw it for myself. But still, the, the, uh, their leader they got rid of. Um, 
so uh, Netanyahu would be taking a very big risk to go to an election, especially an election that would be held in the height of a pandemic when the flu will be compounding uh, the, the other annoying virus. And, and while you maybe could forecast success with polls, you cannot forecast uh, a pandemic and you cannot forecast uh, economic, an economic situation that could be out of control. Uh, so that's why I, along with actually caring about the country, I don't think in the end Netanyahu will decide to take us to an election. I think that sometime tomorrow uh, they're going to say, haha, just kidding, and uh, we'll go back to governing. But on, the bill that they're passing gives an 100 day extension to pass the budget. They're not, they're, it doesn't say we're not going to elections. It, it, it's just pushing everything off a, a little bit, not too much. Um, and uh, it could very well be that those, uh, those 100 days then we can end up going to an election. The deadline ends up being December 3rd, 100 days from tomorrow. Uh, then we'll end up going to an election uh, three months after that uh, in March. Um, and uh, that would be, uh, uh, unfortunately, right now, the most likely possibility, with another possibility being uh, the, the last day to pass a budget in 2021 is the 31st of March by law, and then we could go to an election in June. Uh, any day after that, the coalition agreement would require Netanyahu to leave office on the 21st of November and have Benny Gantz take over as prime minister via the rotation agreement that they agreed to in May. Um, and uh, it's very hard to see Netanyahu actually agreeing to leave the prime minister's office. Uh, he believes that he and only he can save the country. And um, that is uh, a point that, that he can make. I mean, it, uh, it's hard to remember there being a different prime minister over here. Uh, and Netanyahu has been in office since 2009. Here we are 11 years later. He was also in office 96 to 99. He is our longest serving leader in Israel's history. Um, and uh, people don't remember the, the, the pre Netanyahu days. Um, and he can argue that at various points, not including now, he made Israel's economy better than ever. And he can argue that the diplomatic and security situations are better than ever, that right now, we're not facing an immediate threat. Uh, Lebanon has been hit by an environmental disaster uh, and that compounded all the disasters they've had before of their own civil wars. And so Hezbollah is not in a place to be attacking us in a serious kind of way. Iran has 20,000 deaths from the coronavirus. Uh, they are not going to be giving uh, too much money right now to Hamas to start a war against us either. Um, and so the situation in the region is getting better, um, and that's working in Israel's favor. The enemy of your enemy is your friend, and Iran has many enemies, and so uh, countries around the region have decided that they could be friends with us, with encouragement of the United States. And for that, you absolutely have to give credit to the current administration in Washington, uh, which has really sent a message to the world that the path to Washington goes through Jerusalem. When the embassy, which is across the street from where I live, if I'd open the, the if I'd go out on the porch, doing that, I'd have to go through six loud children. But if I'd go out on the porch, um, I could show you the American embassy across the street. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the, the week after we moved in a year ago uh, and said, uh, what a great view we have here, they started building a very large wall. Uh, between us and the embassy. Uh, you American taxpayers are paying for it, and it's no joke. Uh, I, I don't know why they did it, I guess, to keep me out. I, or, so I couldn't look, I don't know. Uh, but uh, there now is a very large wall between me and that embassy, but we can still see over it uh, uh, to uh, the uh, uh, Dead Sea area to where our friend Uri lives and uh, where uh, Rabbi, uh, the elder Rabbi Lairfield uh, and uh, his son. Uh, live today. Um, so uh, the um, the situation here, we, we really have to, we, America sent a message uh, to the world by moving that embassy that it, 
you better not mess with Israel. Uh, when uh, America shows that Israel is its ally, then that makes the Middle East countries say, well, we have to be more careful. Uh, and that made the entire Middle East safer. Um, and it may create an atmosphere that led to the agreement with the United Arab Emirates, where uh, they basically, the uh, leaders of the United Arab Emirates told the Palestinians, we're not waiting for you anymore. Uh, they'd wanted to make a deal with us for years, and they didn't because of the Palestinians. Um, because there was this feeling that in the Arab world that the Palestinians have to be helped first. And the, the UAE said, forget about it. We want this deal that will bring us in official contact beyond the unofficial contacts that there've been for so many years with the top um, um, innovative country in the Middle East uh, that uh, shows how to make the desert bloom that, that's been the model for so many countries around here. Um, that has one of the top economies in the Middle East and that is closest to the president of the United States. Um, so that is what led to this deal. And um, it is uh, wonderful that Israel has proven that you don't have to give up land in order to get peace, that you really can trade for peace for peace as we are. And that is leading to other countries coming on board soon. Bahrain is going to be coming on board soon. Oman is now visited and will be coming on board soon. Sudan. Now, what we don't know yet is when these countries come on board soon, do they also get the F-35 uh, fighter jet, the top uh, fighter jet on, on the earth uh, that uh, the United Arab Emirates is getting, though technically not part of the deal. Um, I, I hope that Sudan, well, they can't afford it anyway, but I, I hope that they are not getting uh, any fighter jets if they end up making peace with us. Uh, I hope that they are all going to be making peace with us on our merits uh, of uh, being good people to have good relations with. Um, now, obviously, part of it was also the United Arab Emirates being able to say that they got Israel off the annexation train, the train uh, to take uh, communities in Judea and Samaria, the biblical heartland of the Jewish people, uh, that were going to be annexed into Israel, uh, keeping their same status. So let, let's explain what that means. Uh, right now, if my car is getting stolen right now as we speak here in Jerusalem, my insurance company will cover that. If Uri's car is getting stolen right now as we speak, he's in deep trouble uh, because he is not living uh, technically in uh, land governed by the laws of Israel. He is in land that is governed by uh, the Civil Service Administration of the IDF. Um, and so that is something that has made the citizen, the Jewish citizens, of Judea and Samaria, second-class citizens by the state of Israel, discriminated against completely by the state of Israel. People tell you, oh, oh those folks in the West Bank are discriminated against the, the Jews uh, and the Arabs. Uh, they do not have the same status as Arabs in pre-67 Israel either. Uh, and that would have all changed if Israel would apply Israeli law to some or all of those territories which is what the annexation plan would have done. It would have uh, applied Israeli law to about 30% of the land where the overwhelming majority of Jews in Judea and Samaria live. Uh, and it would uh, apparently have created a Palestinian state as well. Um, uh, whether it would be like other states in the world, apparently not. It would have been very different from that. Uh, talking somewhere between a, a, a state minus and, and uh, autonomy plus. Um, the fate of the Palestinians living there, most of them would become uh, part of the Palestinian Authority uh, and have to be governed by their laws, which a lot of them would really prefer to live by our laws and, uh, and, and the, what they have in their current status. Um, but uh, that will apparently not be happening yet. It's now says it still uh, very much intends to and uh, there is a chance that if Donald Trump is reelected president of the United States, that another year from now, this will reemerge, especially if the Christian evangelicals decide that it's important to them. One of the reasons that the annexation did not happen, that applying sovereignty to this land did not happen, was because the evangelicals privately told the president of the United States, we don't really care. Uh, they care about 
Israel controlling the biblical heartland of the Jewish people? And we do. Do they, but did they care about Israel having actual sovereignty, this technical thing of, of uh, it being governed by Israeli laws and not by IDF laws? No, they didn't care about that. Whereas making peace in the Middle East, that they told the President of the United States is part of their biblical prophecies. And so in a way, uh, after years of the residents of Judea and Samaria trying to build up an alliance with the Christian evangelical community in the United States, that proved to be a total failure. Uh, it, it, the evangelicals let the settlers down. Um, and that is why there is no sovereignty being applied today. The settler leaders also let their own people down when they spoke in, in very different voices, uh, some criticizing, saying any kind of Palestinian state, no way, forget it, we don't want it. Um, when they went to Washington and lobbied against the, the plan that was intended to help them, uh, the president of the United States does not like that. He, he doesn't like, he, it bothers him when the Jews fight. Uh, that's why he said he likes the Christian evangelicals better. They speak in one united voice, but the, the, the Jews are always fighting. Uh, those are quotes from the president of the United States. So, uh, um, that is what led to applying sovereignty not happening. Now, it can still happen if Donald Trump is reelected. Can it still happen if, if Joe Biden is elected? Well, uh, he has said very clearly no in every public speech that it mentions Israel later. Uh, I interviewed Netanyahu in February, uh, just ahead of a, an election, of course. He only gives interviews ahead of election. Um, and my headline that day was, no matter who wins the election of the president of the United States, Donald Trump's plan is going to be advanced, that it changes everything forever. Um, Netanyahu, who, who was raised in Philadelphia, but became a, a New York Giants fan when he was UN ambassador um, um, and went to New York Giants football games regularly, um, uh, used a football term saying the goalposts will have been moved and can never be removed or returned back. Um, now, when he said that, it was already clear that Joe Biden would be the candidate for president of the United States. And uh, Joe Biden calls Netanyahu, my friend, B. Uh, so Netanyahu wouldn't be saying what he told me if there weren't private conversations in which Joe Biden sounded different than he does publicly right now. Now, I advise people never to listen to any politician ahead of an election in any country because um, they say what they want to say to get elected. That's how it works. So Netanyahu is speaking during an election. Now Joe Biden is speaking during an election. And one of them is lying, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you can decide for yourself. I, I leave that to you. I'm, I, I'm not taking sides in any American politics. I'm not taking sides in any Israeli politics. And uh, that is what makes people actually invite me to speak to them, because, uh, I, because opinionated people are boring. And uh, people who can be somewhat objective are, are somewhat interesting, I think, uh, because they're a rare commodity these days. Um, so um, a lot will depend uh, on that American election. We're going to be looking very closely to what happens there with Israel being one of the few countries in the world uh, where Donald Trump has a very strong approval rating over here. But we, we also appreciate our bipartisan relationship that we have when uh, I've spoken college campuses all around America. And what impresses me day in, every time I'm there is to see that my talks get sponsored by the college Republicans and college Democrats together. And then I ask them, well, when was the last time you did an event together? And they tell me uh, last Yom Ha'atzmaut, uh, a year before, um, that Israel is one of the only issues that unites Americans today. And uh, that's something that I think gives me a lot of hope for the future. Um, and uh, so here we are. Uh, we've just begun the month of Elul. Um, uh, because I'm surrounded by synagogues here, I get woke, and they're all praying outside. <laughs> I get woken up by shofar blasts pretty much every 10 minutes between 5.45 a.m. And, and whenever I actually get out of bed. Um, that is a, my own personal pandemic is the shofar, but uh, it's making me... Uh, definitely repent. And uh, I think that this is a time for people and politicians and the uh, countries to work on uh, getting better. Uh, that uh, we're looking ahead to the year ahead, which will be uh, Tafshin Hey Aleph. 
which stands for Tiye uh, Shnat Pius Amiti. A, uh, may this be a year of uh, real reconciliation. And it also stands for Tieshnat uh, Plaim Amitiim. May this be a, a year of uh, real uh, wonders and, and miracles. And so we uh, are praying for that here in Jerusalem, and I'm sure you're praying for that back there in Memphis and uh, next year in uh, Jerusalem for all of us. Thank you very much to Rabbi Lairfield and to the organizers. Thank you, Gil, so much. Always informative, always so interesting, and always so engaging. Uh, again, if anyone wants to ask questions, you can uh, send to me in the chat, and we can do it that way. Uh, or uh, we have a, a, a friendly group here. Um, you can unmute yourself uh, and uh, ask a question to Gil right now. Uh, Gil, uh, Andy Groveman here. Um, would you mind going, are, are you saying that the talks that were started last night between Blue and White and Lakut are just simply over trying to extend out uh, the 100 day date? And maybe you could review maybe one more time. What they're fighting over. What are the different dates and trigger points mm -hmm because your head explodes when you start trying to keep up with this. And I know you know it like the ABCs. Okay, so um, to answer your question, first of all, 11.59 tomorrow night, uh, th there is tonight, there's a meeting at nine o'clock of the Knesset Finance Committee, which is a, a real um, horrible thing for a print new newspaper, <laughs> because uh, that means that somehow between 9 p.m. and um, 9.45, I have to send a news story and an analysis. So they better really announce at the very beginning uh, what they're doing. Uh, if not, uh, I'm gonna have to uh, write three different news stories and two different analyses. Uh, I had to do that, by the way, after the, between election one and election two. Um, that night, I was waiting in the Knesset um, for the uh, Likud negotiating team to come back from the prime minister's office to tell me whether there was a deal by midnight. It was a, and and the, it was like 10 something and the paper was closing. And so I see them approaching from afar. I'm the only one there and they're in front of the door of the Knesset. And I go like this to them and they go like that to me. I had a, three stories written on uh, uh, saying with all different scenarios, going to elections, not going to elections and somewhere in between two different analyses all written out in advance. And uh, I, when they went like that to me, I, I clicked on my, I had a tweet ready on my phone and a tweet ready on my computer with opposite reports. And so I tweeted on my phone. They saw it in the office of the Jerusalem Post a split second later. They sent out the story a split second later. And that's how the entire world found out that we were going to a second election. Um, and uh, how we scooped the entire world by getting them before they even came into the building. Um, so that might end up happening again. Um, so uh, tonight, uh, hopefully at 9 p.m., they'll announce that they reached a deal and they'll vote for it in the Knesset Finance Committee and then they'll be ready to vote when the Knesset plenum convenes tomorrow. Uh, but uh, knowing them, they'll wait until tomorrow. And uh, sometime in the afternoon, the, the only then will the committee meet and pass it and only in at like 11.50 at night, they'll pass it in the plan on knowing that. And uh, that would then uh, d delay our uh, next, delay the deadline for passing a state budget till the 3rd of December. And if they don't pass a budget by then, then we have elections in March. Um, now, what are they fighting over? Um, they said they were fighting over a one-year budget or a two-year budget, but they never really were. Two one-year budgets or one two-year budget. Um, what they're fighting over is uh, appointments to key positions. We haven't had a police chief in two years. Uh, we haven't had a state prosecutor in several months now. Uh, the attorney general, uh, whose term ends in February 22, uh, is the interim state prosecutor. And Netanyahu doesn't like him um, because he indicted him in three cases. Um, so uh, it's, Netanyahu wants to have influence on who the state prosecutor is going to be, even though it's too late for his case. Um, he believes that the state prosecutors have had too much power. Um, 
and uh, over the police chief, even though it's too late for him with the police as well. Um, and he wants to have power when it comes to appointing an attorney general as well, even though that's pretty far off in the future. Gil, uh, a couple questions came came uh, my way. Um, just want to, I'll, I'll give them to you all together and I can repeat them if you need to. Uh, the first is um, talking back to the pandemic for a moment. When do you think Israel will start to allow uh, Americans or foreigners to, to come to Israel? Uh, the second is uh, we've been following closely the news about what's going on on the Gaza front with Hamas. Things uh, seem to be heating up a little bit. Uh, I'd be curious to know your take. And then the third, going back to what you were just talking about, is um, uh, what is Netanyahu's uh, succession plan? Uh, what what is likely for the future, or, or or is there no succession plan? Is it just is Netanyahu's plan just to continue uh, indefinitely? Okay. First of all, when Americans will be allowed to come into Israel? No plan in sight, unfortunately, for that. No foreigners. Um, they did allow the students to come here to study on one-year programs that are authorized by the Jewish Agency, and so we've had thousands of yeshiva students mainly coming uh, over the last couple weeks. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, you're not bringing too many bad things with them. Uh, but uh, that was the one exception that was made at the, because we've got Haredim and, and uh, religious Zionists in the government. And not the religious Zionist party, but we could, uh, that wants to be a religious Zionist party. Um, and um, so uh, that, that's it. Um, unfortunately, uh, no end in sight. I wish I could say something different. And you know, I'm saying this as someone who was supposed to speak in March to uh, JLI, to the largest group of uh, foreigners who come into our country ever on, on that uh, Chabad educational trip. So I'm supposed to speak to 700 people and um, so sad to see that go. Um, it's where I got to know uh, Rabbi Klein so well. Um, so, uh, second question, Gaza, Hamas, so, look, it, it, they're firing rockets again and Israel's firing back very seriously and, and um, I don't expect it to intensify too much just because they don't have the support of their patrons in Iran to be able to do it um, and because they have to be dealing with their coronavirus issues because if things would spread spread too much over there. They live very close together, more than anything. It's the most densely populated place in the world, um, other than Manhattan. Manhattan and Gaza have things in common. Um, and they, uh, it would be, it would be a, it would spread very, very quickly. They have to be very careful. Um, and Israel's also helping Gaza in dealing with uh, the pandemic and keeping the numbers down there because we don't have an interest in uh, things getting out of control over there. So, uh, I don't expect it to be a, a very serious uh, security situation, whereas saying that there's tension on the southern border is enough for Netanyahu and Gantz to use that as an excuse to come down from the tree tomorrow or tonight, uh, please God, tonight, and uh, by deadline of the Prince of Peace edition, um, and to um, have excuses are good things for politicians to have. Um, being responsible and everything. And they can say that that's changed. I mean, the coronavirus, they should have been thinking and acting differently now for months, and they haven't been. Uh, but the security situation would be a, a new thing that they could say. Um, okay, and then that leads to the succession question, which is, um, look, uh, for the, the old joke uh, was that uh, the person who would replace Netanyahu would be Netanyahu. Um, the uh, his son, he's now uh, 29 years old, um, and uh, but he's uh, a professional internet troll right now, and he's upset a lot of people, and uh, got caught uh, going to strip clubs uh, with security guards and drivers paid by the state, and uh, so it's not going to be him, and we're not going to be uh, like other countries in the Middle East, like Syria, you know, that have had the. Uh, the uh, sun uh, automatically take over. There are also synagogues like that in the United States uh, that have had the uh, the sun take over for the rabbi. Um, but uh, the um, I, I appreciate Rabbi Lairfield turning down his grandfather's uh, congregation. He, he could have been 
uh, the rabbi of a, a much larger sanctuary with about 12 Jews who are still uh, walking, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, he made the right choice to be with you guys. Um, so um, right now, look, there are plenty of young up and coming leaders in Netanyahu's Likud party. And the most interesting election in Israel's history will be the one to replace Netanyahu's head of Likud. Uh, because this is a job that only comes up once every 20, 30 years. If you look back, the Likud has only had only four leaders going back to the 1930s. And they all became prime minister. You know them all. Menachem Begin, Yitzhak Shamir, Ariel Sharon, Netanyahu. So that's a job with a lot of staying power, uh, like rabbi of a, of a synagogue. You, you get that job, they let, they let you stay around for a long time. Uh, so um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you have 15 people run for leader of Likud whenever that election ends up happening. And, and then, uh, you know, a party of about 100,000 members, uh, all you'll need is about 5,000 people to vote for you in order to win such an election or in order to make a runoff that'll go among the two top finishers. Um, so uh, really, uh, anything can happen. It'll be fascinating. Stay tuned to www.jpost.com. Whenever that will happen, whether it's in a few months or uh, another uh, 30 years, I'll give, just give you the, the best case scenario for Netanyahu is that he has another election. He makes peace with seven Arab countries. The week before the election, the economy improves, the health situation improves. He wins by a landslide. And then he passes that French law that allows uh, that says that uh, a prime minister in office can't be investigated and his legal situations have to be frozen. Um, and uh, he passes all kinds of immunity bills and everything of immunity from prosecution. And he, he can pass the immunity from death bill uh, to make him not have to have death not apply to him, in which case he could then be prime minister forever and ever and ever. Uh, that is a scenario that's out there. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Gil. One, one last uh, question, just because you mentioned it, uh, and, and we'll uh, wrap up. I want to be sensitive to your time and your impending deadlines. Um, you, you mentioned uh, you know, peace in the Middle East. When, when do you think uh, Israel will have full relations with Saudi Arabia and some of those other countries as well? Um, you know, uh, one of those other acronyms is Tiyeshnat Paradma, uh, the, the red heifer that, that leads to the Messiah coming. And uh, that's when we'll have uh, real peace in the Middle East. But then again, uh, uh, which could happen soon if the Cubs have won the World Series. Uh, and uh, with God's help, we'll win the World Series again this year. Um, then uh, that is what could lead to that real Middle East peace. The Saudis want but they're in a very much more sensitive situation than the United Arab Emirates. The United Arab Emirates, their people, they're, uh, what, 11% minority that their people really are, um, with the rest being foreigners who serve them, uh, they care about money. Uh, and so it, it was in their financial interest to make a deal with Israel. Whereas the Saudis, uh, they have to care about being leaders of the Muslim world religiously. And for them, making an agreement with Israel, it's, it's a lot tougher. You'd have to have, maybe if you have four or five uh, Arab Muslim countries, uh, and it becomes a trend, then the crown prince of Saudi Arabia really can have an easier time selling it to his people and to the Arab and Muslim world. Um, it, we're going in that direction. Um, unfortunately, it was a snag about a year and a half ago now when uh, the uh, Saudis made the mistake that I hope none of you make the next time that you meet me uh, when they killed a Middle Eastern journalist. Just a, a bad idea. Don't do it. Um, uh, but what that did was it, it made the Saudis more beholden to an administration in Washington than they've ever been before. The, the uh, last three American presidents wanted the Saudis to become involved in a peace process, and they all refused, uh, including to Donald Trump in his first trip abroad. He went to Saudi Arabia and asked the Saudis to be involved in a peace process, and they said no. And they, they only changed their mind uh, when you... They had to become more beholden after the uh, killing of that Middle Eastern journalist. Um, and so that has led them to be very involved behind the scenes in what led to the United Arab Emirates deal and what would lead to deals with Bahrain and Oman that are other Saudi satellite allies. Um, but them themselves, 
uh, we still have a long way to go. Um, so uh, what I'd like to end with, I guess, is people always ask me, what can I do to help Israel from where I live? And um, unfortunately, you can't get on a plane tomorrow to come here, except if you declare your Aliyah, in which case you would be welcomed with open arms uh, and a, 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 a absorption uh, basket of funding. Uh, but barring that, um, I say that uh, helping Israel is easy, E-A-S-Y, which stands for education, advocacy, solidarity, and, and your money. And uh, all of those things can be done during a pandemic, learning as much as you can about what's going on here by reading the Jerusalem Post online at www.jpost.com and Gil and Mr. Hoffman on Twitter. Um, a is for advocacy and being involved in all your pro-Israel movements. I, I have spoken for APAC in Memphis before many years ago um, and uh, other wonderful pro-Israel movements that you have over there. Uh, and uh, S is for solidarity, which you showed by giving up your Sunday. You could be watching uh, basketball right now. No, I guess a little early. Baseball, a little early. But uh, um, I am sure you're missing out on, on a lot of fun. You could be going to that JCC and eating that yummy food that I ate. Um, and uh, uh, the real why is your prayers. Uh, come to your synagogue uh, out to meet in outdoors every day there, Rabbi? We're outdoors uh, for the most part, uh, just starting indoors as well. Okay, so you, you know, you've, you've got squirrels instead of cats to daven with, but um, it's a little different than we have here, but uh, I'm sure it's very meaningful and, and less mel melodious, so quicker, which is good. Um, so I encourage people to go to the Baron Hirsch Synagogue and, and pray for a better future for Israel and, and uh, for America and uh, for the world. Uh, thank you very much. And if you know anyone in other communities around America who could use a speaker on Zoom uh, at any time, day or night, uh, I am uh, available. My email address is gil at jpost.com, G-I-L at jpost.com. Uh, spread the word. Thank you. Again, we thank uh, Gil so much uh, for making the time and being, again, so informative to us uh, on such important issues. A special welcome and thank you again uh, to our new uh, program director, Uri Polachowski, who helped uh, organize this. We're looking forward to spending more time with you, Uri, and more programs and looking forward to starting to bring back some of our Sunday morning uh, yeah. Israel updates. So please uh, keep a lookout for that uh, coming up in the, in the next uh, few weeks. I'm wishing everybody a wonderful day. Thank you all so much. Thank and take you. Take care and stay safe. And then Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very informative.